for you to click on your slides. Architect Jimmy will now deliver his gold medal address. Over to you, Architect Jimmy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, fellow architects, Dylan Tay, president of PAM, fellow past presidents, uh, future architects, and students. I stand here this uh, evening humble, humble at the thought that the Institute should honor me with the gold medal for design excellence. When I first set out my career to be an architect, it never crossed my mind that I would ever be able to ascend to this level of excellence and to be recognized by an in institute. For this, I'm very humble. I'd like to say thank you. <laughs> I started my career as an architect or in architecture when my parents sent me off to Australia in, 19, in 1959 on a ship. I went to school and I started architecture in 1964 and graduated in 1969. Thereafter, I started my career as a professional architect. When I was in school at the university, we were involved in quite a lot of students' activist activities. We used to campaign for the freedom from hunger, stop the Vietnam War. When John Woodson resigned, we were out in the streets uh, demonstrating. I wonder what happened. Am I supposed to turn the slides on or something? Oh, OK. Here, here, here. My fault. So I went to Sydney in the ship, you see. In those days, the ship took 12 days from Singapore to Sydney. This ship that you see there is the Iberia. It was a 30-ton MS steamship, and uh, it only carried about uh, 600 passengers compared to the sh cruise lines today that takes up to five to 6,000 people. And uh, the picture on the, on the right was my headmaster in the school, he was very tough. He made me tough. He made me into a fighter. Always believe in what I believe in and never subs, you know, succumb to it. That's why I was never popular with some of my clients, because I always tell them the wrong thing. You see the pictures of the students there, demonstrating the four of them. The one on the extreme right, on extreme, ex extreme left, that's me. <laughs> All right? you, just, you can just get a glimpse of the nerd looking kid there, all right? So it's Otsun, because he, he, he resigned from... Uh, then, I when I graduated, I applied for a job to be on the design team for the National University of Singapore's new campus at Kent Ridge. The terms and conditions were very good. They would give you a two-year contract, they send you to Singapore with your family. They pay for all the expenses. When you're in Singapore, they will give you housing. They'll give you a car. They'll give you all sorts of things. And after the contract, they will send you back to repatriate back to Australia. I said, that's fine, because at that time, I had already applied for permanent residence. And I was a permanent resident of Australia. And my daughter was born there. And uh, I intended to stay on in Sydney, Australia. So I applied after, you know, in those days we don't have email, faxes or anything, it's letter writing. Letter used to take four to five days either way. So it took a year to negotiate your terms and conditions. So great, after that they say go for medical work, check up and all that. I got a job 
They said, you got a job. I said, terrific, I've got a job. Please give me my contract. So when they sent me the contract, I opened it up. The first thing he said, you shall, for all intent and purpose, be deemed to have been recruited from across the causeway. I was in Sydney. Which causeway are they talking about, I wondered. <laughs> so after consulting some people in the Malaysian High Commission, and I said, they are, they are offering you a contract from Johor. You go over by bus every day. That's a contract. I said, excuse me, that's not what they said in the, in the advertisement. So anyway, I asked them, they said, yeah, well, that's it. See, you are a Malaysian citizen. We cannot give you this. That contract is reserved for the orang putih, the expats. You know, this is the way government think, the Singapore government. You know, they look down on Malaysia, and that pissed me off. So I kept my hair long. So whenever I went to Singapore in those days, I would go in with my hair long, and they can't do anything. So anyway, that's it. anyway after that, I got all excited about uh, uh, coming back to work in the tropics. Then I applied, I applied for a job with this firm called Project Architect. Project Architect at that time had just won the, the design for the new civic center in Petaling Jaya. So, but I wasn't working on that job. I was working on some other projects. I came back and I started my career here. And uh, so, whilst with Project Architect in 1973, we were doing a project design project for Gunung Rapat development in Ipoh. So we had made a presentation to the uh, state secretary of Para Ipoh at that time. We went up there, we spent uh, a couple of months doing the design and uh, went to show him the, uh, the, the, the work that we were doing. So, but before he started looking at all design, like all oh, good government servants, they all divert your attention. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? They all talk about this, they talk about that, they talk about cash flow, they talk about ROI, they talk about it else. They say, hey, excuse me, you know, we were told to look at the potential of this place, da, 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 what can be done, but we were not asked to look at all the numbers. So, you know, but he got a bit frustrated. Well, that's fine. I mean, the client gets frustrated, architects get frustrated too. He's saying, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, a oh, oh, bunch of rocks. I just blast it up. I sell the aggregate. Each, each cubic meter, I get five ringgit. You know, very good. <coughs> so it went on and on. The time I was very new. I just been, spent 13 years in Australia, and I've come back to Malaysia. And I listened to this guy say, "What a twerk he is!" You know, carrying on the way. I said, "Excuse me, sir. You mean all you see are just rocks, and you can just blast them up and sell them?" He sort of look at me. Oh, brilliant deduction. How did you figure it out? Of course, I blast them. I make money. I said, therefore, all those drawings that were prepared for you and all that, you looked at it as just a bunch of sheets of paper. Nothing inside there. Oh, he got so angry. How can this young punk insult me, you know? He started hopping up and down. You know, most unbecoming of a state secretary of Perak. He's jumping up in a short little fellow and all. Oh, in a suit, you know, that didn't fit him very well. <laughs> so, but of course, when that happened, everybody got scared. My, my, my boss got scared, told me, shut up, shut up, don't say anything. <laughs> and apologize, apologize, let me kiss your hand, kiss your bum, you know, everything. <laughs> so anyway, that's it. So I never said anything after that. On the way back, he said, you know, Jimmy, he said, you are very lucky. No, he didn't call me Jimmy, he called me CS. He said, CS, you're very lucky, you know. He could have sent you out of Ipo with the police. Right? And call that. I said, oh, okay. Right. Well, it's not, not often you get sent out of a place with police escort, you know what I mean? So, never mind. So, that's life. So, I started my practice in 1978. Uh, and uh, before I knew it, whole of KL was talking about monorail. Pam was talking about monorail. We were everybody, including Lat. Lat was also talking about monorail, right? And he made many cartoons about monorail. We were all very worried what effect is going to have on the environment. I mean, those days we were, we architects were a bit silly. We we were worried about environment, you know, uh, pollution. But now you look at KL, you got flyovers here, fly over there, you know, everywhere. You go to up to where's a place where curves. Um, What's the Kota, is it Kota Damansara or something? That whole place is like crazy, crazy concrete, you know? Anyway, never mind. 
So Pam, we, we were very concerned. You know, those days we were very dynamic. This was at the time when Ken Young was going to take over as president of Pam. Uh, he, David Tay, and a few other fellows, you know, had just thrown the old guards out, and Ken was elected the president. So, the the information committee under Ruslan Khalid called for a meeting. I was the co-chairman. Called a meeting. Everybody was there. You name it. You know, Kamil Marikan was there. Lee Kong Len was there. Nyong Nyom was there. You know, Fei Chia was there, of course. You know, Ken Yang was there, David Tay, everybody. I don't know any of you are there because they're all too young. <laughs> right? So, everyone said we must resist. Okay, so that was it. We said we will do that. And two weeks later, I got a call from Raja Dure. He said, hey, the, the newspaper wants to talk to you. I said, why? He said, well, apparently the supply of the monorail is in town. They're going to see that to Banda. I said, oh, I said, why don't you speak to Ruslan? He said, oh, Ruslan is overseas on holiday. You are the co-chairman. You have to do the talking. Okay, so I talk. So when you talk, you talk, and you never know what the newspaper write, what? So next morning, next day, in the afternoon, when I opened the Malay Mail, oh, I tell you, I couldn't believe my eyes. On page two and three, right across, it says monorail. White elephant, quote Jimmy Lim, Pam Rep. <laughs> so I was responsible for calling Rep. I never say it was white elephant. I just outlined all the things that we had discussed that were bad. But never mind. I mean, the moral of the story sometimes you have to speak and tell what is expected, right? So, next thing. I found out that Datuk Banda had freaked out. That time was Elias Omar. Elias Omar was freaking out. He was jumping up and down. But thank God Elias was a bit tall. Yeah? So when he, he jumps, you know, you can see him. Jump. When a short fellow jumps, he looks a bit funny. <laughs> so Elias Omar was very angry. Call out Pam, say, hey, who is this Jimmy Lim? You know, he should be sacked from the Architects Association. He should not be an architect, not allowed. How can he say things like that that insult the sensitivity of Datu Banda? Oh, so, but I didn't know, but this was apparently conveyed to all the past presidents, and all the past presidents were shaking like nobody's business. You know what, what was shaking, you know, they're all shaking, <laughs> all between their legs. And that time, Ken Yang had just been president in two weeks. He, he also didn't know what to do, and he was going, uh, 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 uh. Okay, so. They had a meeting. They called a meeting to, to, to discuss about this issue. And they wanted to know why did Jimmy Lim say that it was a white elephant. But then they did not ask Jimmy Lim to be present, to explain. They decided among themselves, they said what they did. So I was waiting outside, hoping to be called in. But they did not. This was in the old Tangsi building. Next moment, Raja Dure the predecessor of HR came running. I said, hey, Raja, what's happening? Oh, cannot talk, cannot talk. Must go, must go to the press, must go to the press. I said, what the hell is he going to the press for? Well, I was to find out next day. Next morning, in all the newspapers in KL, under classified, apology. Pam wishes to apologize to Dato Banda Elias Tansri, no, doctor in those days, he was doctor. Dantri Elias Omar for the embarrassment caused by the, by the article White Elephant. No? Uh, Pam Rep, Jimmy Lim. That's, that was the apology. And then the next line of explanation. Now, this is coming from the Institute of those days. I'm not talking about now. Huh? Now it's different, those days. <laughs> hey. Jimmy Lim, although a council member, was speaking on his own behalf. Hua Lao. Talk about backstabbing. <laughs> what Mahathir is doing now is nothing compared to <laughs> those days. You know? So your institute hang you up to try. Please kill him. <laughs> what to do? That's my life. So, but I thought my career finished. You know, how could you go through your institute, disown you publicly in all the newspapers? <clears throat> but one thing was good. In those days, I used to socialize quite a lot. 
among the embassies, <coughs> American embassies, German embassies, the Italians, the British High Com, uh, Australian High Com, used to go to parties, you know, every week there'll be cocktail parties, you know, and then when I went there, people used to come up to me and say, hey, Jimmy, good on you. I said, what for? He said, for speaking out about, about the monorail. Oh, I said, yes, yes, yes. I, I, was, I was almost killed by my institute. Oh, your institute, I tell you, they've got no, you know what, between the legs. <laughs> you are the only one who had it. Good on you. And uh, it happened quite a lot. And after a while, I said, hey, it's okay, yeah? Maybe my career not tamat yet, you know? I can still carry on what well, I carried on. And I'm here tonight, you know? So I'm very grateful for that. So that's life, you know? <coughs> so I, I, think, I think the lesson which I really want to share with a lot of you young people here is, at the end of the day, be true to yourself. Huh? Be true to yourself, be true to what you believe in. Don't worry about what people say, right? Like our president Lilian Tay earlier on said, I did a lot of things that people don't think about and my passion used to get me into trouble, all sorts of things. But heritage is something which was to me very important because it's about us. Who are we? Right? We are Malaysians. Is that what I always say? Today was yesterday's tomorrow. Just as today will become tomorrow's yesterday. So it, it, it's very important. So this is what, when I reflect back, my contribution towards PAM ended 30 years ago when I stopped as president. When I stopped now as president, I never served in PAM council anymore. And now, even now, it's been 30 years since I stepped down as president. But the point is, I'm still an architect. I'm still doing what I'm doing. And that's it, you know, if I can contribute, I will contribute. And so, please, boys and girls, for those of you who are looking in entering the profession, go into the profession in a way, the way. It's just like Le Corbusier said, to enter the architectural profession is like joining to become a mon to, to enter a monastery, right? You, you, you give yourself completely to God. In architecture, you give yourself completely to architecture, and that's it. <coughs> So, so I serve in PAM, I serve in every committee. I was co-chairman and chairman of all the committees we are in PAM. <coughs> I was on site, I became vice president. Then I stood for president and I was elected to be the president. But then prior to that, I was approached by this credit card people called MasterCard. Well, they were doing this series. <laughs> A master, they want to do master horticulturist, master dentist, master woodcutter, master violinist. Then they said, hey, architect should be quite good. So they want a master architect. So I was approached. Then I thought of them, well, I'm not saying I am good. I'm advertising to say that I use this master card. Then they say that, well, if you use a master card, then you must be master of somebody, <laughs> right? So <laughs> that was the so I said okay. So I did it. So they came. We had a lot of fun making the the, the thing and all that. So when 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 this whole thing came out, it was in the Time magazine. It was in all those you know Fortune, uh, Newsweek, you know Southeast Asia thing. It was in the television, local television, international television. My, my cousin in Singapore, she was watching football one night, you know, <coughs> and then suddenly the screen came on, you know, advertisement time, boom, and she saw me there, said, oh my goodness, what am I doing there? You know? So it was everywhere. But anyway, cut a long story short, it got a Singapore Institute of Architect a little bit like that. Huh? Huh? That time, King Soon was the president. You know, Te King Soon, I think he's now for our, our something, yeah. Uh, so they reported to Lembaga. So Lembaga said, oh, advertisement, yes. I don't know who was in Lem then those days, you must check, huh? Those people, <laughs> who, who were in. So they went, oh, yes. They, said, they wrote me, you must explain, you have been 
advertising, calling yourself, describing yourself in superlative terms and all that. So you have, you have uh, breached the code of conduct. So we're hearing of it, I don't know, some days. So we waited. Then later on, they sent me a letter. Oh, your charge of advertising has been changed to conduct in the opinion of Lumbaga is either disgraceful or unbecoming. What's disgraceful? What's unbecoming? It's neither here nor there, right? So, I mean, could be anything. I don't want to describe what I think could be. Uh, but at that time, my good friend, uh, Vincent Powell Smith, told me, Yes, I think you must have done something to Kington Low to get him so upset with you, don't you? Never mind. So anyway, the board found me guilty and I was fine. And uh, that's the story of my life. So I thought, well, what to do? At eight, at, in 1988, so I, 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 I took over as a PAM president. I still continue. And then after that, I stepped down. Because I think the fact that I was fined by the Lombarga would have been too much of a disgrace for Lamb, you know, to have someone sitting in the council. So ever since then, I, so I thought life would carry on. And then suddenly, when I was in Penang, I was talking about heritage, preserving heritage, which I've been saying for a long time. Don't cut the hills, don't cut the trees. And what? suddenly, the chief minister sued me. He said, hey, you have defame me. I, excuse me, what, how have I defamed you? You know, I don't know, no, but the fellow very a bit thin-skinned no, when he wants to be. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he, you know, so he sued me, sued the newspaper, everyone, sued. He, uh, then we said, well, no, no, he, he first asked for apology. I said, what is there to apologize? I didn't apologize. Then he said, well, Next, pay compensation. I said, pay compensation for what? You haven't lost anything? I haven't damaged anything? Oh, but no, my, anyway, he took a suit because he had a lawyer who was very good boy, you know. He got that to ship after the case, you know, the, the lawyer. So he sued us for 300,000. Of course, in Penang, the first round, the Penang High Court judge, of course, we lost. Then we appealed to Putrajaya, Putrajaya threw it out and that's it, <coughs> finish, end of game. See, there you are. Yeah, all the things. Well, I like, well, my son even said something up there, you know, <laughs> and all that. And uh, I think Sexan, yeah, Sexan also gave some comments, you know, <laughs> all that sort of thing. Uh, Shawa, I said, go, Jimmy, hantam kao kao. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a lot of supporters. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was good, actually. I mean, you see, like, for example, the whole uh, team of lawyers, they were there, they supported us. They provided pro bono service because they, in their own ways, also believed in, 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 in what we were doing was right. I mean, we did not really defame them. And uh, so that, that, that is, that's it. So that was quite recent. So now I think Guan Eng look at me. He still thinks he wants to fight. I don't know, but I don't really think it's any <coughs> point. <laughs> so fellow colleague, I was just sharing you the journey of my experience. And uh, what I have to say is, throughout this period, I've always enjoyed myself. I've thrown myself into the profession with a lot of passion. And to those of you who have had the advantage of being uh, close to me, working with me for, would realize that I try to do what I believe in, and I don't try to do anything, and I don't try to negotiate on things and all that, and just do what you believe to do. And I think that's very important. Um, we must, in our own individual self, be dedicated to our profession, to move our profession forward. Huh? Because nobody's going to do it for us. But many years ago, I still remember Ken Young was telling us, nobody will blow your trumpet. You must." Blow your own trumpet. Ah, but the question is, when you blow your own trumpet, must make sure you blow a good tune. And don't play, don't blow the tune that is a bit out of tune. And that's when you get into problems, okay? 
So you see, th 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 this is the sort of things that was going on in Penang. <coughs> so we had to say that. You see, you got an old Botak Hill, then you got a middle height, new Botak Hill, and then the chief minister is on the 26th floor of Komta, and that you're almost eye level to this hill, and he couldn't see it. My goodness, something is wrong. But never mind. <coughs> I think we are in a great profession. It's a great profession to be enjoyed. It's a very fulfilling profession. I found it to be fulfilling, and I, and I mean it, and I say it with my, with, with, with my whole heart. And I think it's very important that all of us, as we enter this profession, we enter it with our passion intact, we have to be brave, we have to persevere, we have to do a lot of things, maintain our self-respect and integrity. You know, when I first came back to <coughs> Kuala Lumpur in 1972, 73, that we were, I, I had entered into the Malaysian profession at that point, which was at the high point of the new economic policy and a lot of things were changing. So I had to adapt to the rules and regulations that was being applied then, and had to maneuver. And I think despite all these um, uh, sort of uh, rules and what have you that were being, uh, what you call, altered and changed in that period, I've been able to come up and craft an architecture which I feel very proud as a Malaysian, which I can say that my work reflects the environment. My work reflects the culture, the tradition, which I grew up with. I grew up in Penang, in the kampong. I know I still feel the touch of the kampong, and that is my culture. And that is what I try to show in my work. And I think this is what we all have to, and, uh, and, uh, and do that. And in the process, if we can give some time to the institute, we have to do that. Now, you know, because I, I have taken the liberty of asking Pam to reproduce in this booklet, which you can get on your way out, a lot of the editorials which uh, Chris have read, say, that I've written during my time as vice president and president. A lot of issues that were written then 30 years ago, I don't know whether they are still here or not today, because you guys are in the thick of it, I've already sort of said, gone past that period. But I think most important, every one of us should be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, I'm glad I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm making the architectural profession to be great again. And uh, for that, I'm very thankful to be where I am. In that respect, I also like to say, I'm very thankful for this recognition tonight. And I feel very humble by all of you here who have come to uh, listen to me. <coughs> so thank you once again, uh, Pam, Madam President, and fellow colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Architect Jimmy Lim, for your words of wisdom. Let's give him another big round of applause.